Good morning and a very, very warm welcome to Carlow Free Church. It's great to see you all as we gather at the start of a new week, as we gather in the name of our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. And it's so good to welcome visitors. It's lovely to see you all. And we pray that you be blessed and encouraged as we come to worship together. And if you're joining us online as well, it's great to have you with us. Uh, and we hope that wherever you are, uh, you, you know God's blessing uh, and strength in your lives. Just a couple of things to highlight uh, before we start. Um, uh, thank you so much to everybody who contributed to and supported uh, our chili and quiz evening last night. Uh, we raised £540 for our uh, renovation, uh, for paying off the renovation costs. So that's such a huge, huge help. Uh, and thank you very, very much to everybody uh, who supported the evening. Lots of things uh, on the notice uh, email that went out this morning. If anyone doesn't receive uh, that email and would like to, uh, please just let us know. Even if you're not regularly part of the congregation, you can keep in touch with, uh, with Church News uh, through the email that goes out each week. A couple of things I just want to highlight. One is just a reminder uh, that we want to put together a short booklet uh, with people's testimonies uh, that we can share with our community later this year. So we're looking for people just to write two or three hundred words uh, telling a wee bit of their story of how they came to faith in Jesus. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. Um, just something very, very simple, uh, telling just on one page uh, your story about how you came to faith. We would absolutely love for as many people as possible uh, to participate in this. And even if you're joining online and you're from further away, we'd love to hear your story too. So please, please feel free uh, to send it to us. Um, uh, you can send it uh, to Isabel or you can email it to me. Um, it's an amazing opportunity just, uh, just to tell a whole community a bit of difference that Jesus has made in your life. So we would really appreciate um, your support with that. And then one other thing just to mention is that you'll have seen on the email that um, uh, next week uh, I've been invited uh, to go to America. Uh, and so I'll be traveling there at the end of the week and we'll be there for about 10 or 11 days. I've been invited to a conference in Jackson, Mississippi, and then I'll be uh, preaching and lecturing uh, in North Carolina um, in a couple of weeks time. Uh, so I'll be away for about 10 or 11 days um, very excited, very nervous. Um, I've not done anything like this before, um, not without a teacher with me. I went when I was in school, but not now. Now I'm the teacher. I have to look after myself. Uh, so, but it's an exciting opportunity, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. But I, I do feel conscious that my diary has been very full these past couple of months, and I've been away a lot. And I'm sorry about that. I didn't really mean for it to work out like that. Uh, I've gone after the Easter holidays. It's back to old clothes and porridge. You'll have to put up with me every week. Okay, we're here to worship God together. And we're going to prepare our hearts for worship with the words of Psalm 25, verses 4 to 5. Um, this is our call to worship. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And that's our prayer as we come to worship, that God would just lead us into his ways, uh, teach us and build us up as we worship together. And we're going to sing together the hymn, Christ is Risen. Uh, we meet on the first day of the week because this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And we meet and we exist because Jesus has been resurrected. And so this song captures that so beautifully uh, as we rejoice in the reality of our Savior's resurrection. So the musicians will lead us and we'll stand and sing together. Yeah, sing hallelujah. 
Dear Father, we just come to you today rejoicing in the reality of the resurrection. We thank you that Jesus has risen, that he's alive at your right hand, that he is our Savior, our Lord, our King, our friend. And we pray that as we come to you today, that we would just be drawn into your presence um, more and more, that we would be uh, uh, led deeper into a relationship with you. Because we long for you. We long to know you. We long for you to lead us in your ways, um, we long to be drawn closer to you. And so as we come to start a new week together, we come here, and this is the first thing we want to do, to publicly gather to rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus. And we thank you that we do that in unity with our brothers and sisters all across the world, that all across the globe today, there are people rising up to praise the name of Jesus. And we are so thankful that we can add our voice to their number. So as we come, we pray that you would bless us. We bow before you, our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We worship you, praise and thank you. And we pray that you would bless us and meet with us as we come together to worship just now. Thank you for everybody who's here today. And we pray for each one who's come today. Uh, whatever our circumstances, however uh, the last week has been, we pray, Father, that uh, we would come here with open hearts, ready to hear your voice speaking to us that you would teach us, encourage us, challenge us, comfort us, that you would meet us at our, our, in, in all of our needs and that you would lead us all in your ways. We pray that every one of us here would be refreshed and renewed, re-energized and prepared so that we can live this week and every week of our lives for you. So may your blessing be upon us. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Well, today we are absolutely delighted to welcome Robbie Morrison from Tear Fund, uh, who's going to come and share a wee update uh, about the work that they are doing. So it's a, a huge pleasure to have you with us, and I'm delighted to invite you up to share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to be here with you today. My name, as I said, was, is Robbie Morrison. I work for Tear Fund based in Glasgow. Uh, I'm the church engagement team leader, so I get to spend much of my life traveling around Scotland uh, and sharing of the new of the work of Tear Fund um, around the world. So it's great to, to get to be uh, up in Lewis today. Uh, I arrived yesterday on fairly choppy seas, so it's nice to be on, uh, is that my phone? It's nice to be here. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to give a brief update into Tear Fund. Probably many of you have heard of the name Tear Fund, but if I asked you what we did, maybe you wouldn't be so uh, so clear into knowing what we do. So I thought I'd give a little introduction to who we are, what we do, and then share just some testimonies from around the world of what God is doing uh, through, through the, our church partners around the world. So Tear Fund was started uh, way back in 1968 uh, as a result uh, of what was happening in the Biafran War in, in, in Nigeria and to try and respond to that. Uh, since then, we've grown into an organization where we now work in uh, just under 50 countries around the world. We have a thousand projects 
uh, going uh, on right now, uh, working in some of the poorest com uh, countries, communities around the world, helping people work themselves out of poverty. Our work can really be split into two main categories. We are a part of the DEC, or the Disaster Emergency Committee. Um, you may see on, on the news every now and then when there's an appeal that's raised in response to, uh, to uh, the war in, 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 in Gaza, what's happening there in, in Ukraine, or a natural disaster such as the earthquake in Syria and, and Turkey, which happened last year. So as being part of that, we're able to respond quickly to when there's a disaster unfold. Uh, in the earthquake that happened last year in Syria, within four hours of that earthquake happening, uh, our church partners in Aleppo were able to open their doors and welcome people in who had lost everything and uh, provide them with some shelter and food when they needed it the most. Everything we do as an organization is done through the local church in these communities that we work in. We believe in uh, not only helping people work themselves out of poverty, but we want them to have the opportunity to meet Jesus and to, and to put their faith in him. So we, put, uh, we do everything uh, through the local church, through Christian organizations. And about 90% of the countries we work in, we employ local indigenous staff uh, as part of our tier fund staff who know the community, they know the context, they understand the needs uh, around their country, uh, and they then come back to us and, and say what the needs are. So our disaster response is, is one of our areas, but our, our main focus is, uh, is something that we call church and community transformation. And this is all about training, equipping, empowering the local church to be known as centers for transformation within their community. And we've got a vision of seeing 250,000 churches uh, trained and equipped uh, over the next few years. It's a big vision, but we believe that we've got a big God. Uh, right now, we're just under 30,000 churches around the world, uh, which are, are, are helping uh, to change uh, people's lives in their communities. Uh, a colleague of mine just returned from Burundi yesterday, and she uh, was able to travel the country and see a number of projects that are going on there currently, um, all done through the local church. And uh, through Tear Fund, we were able to provide uh, support and training for a, for a church way up in the mountains as they worked to help uh, returning refugees who had fled the years of, of uncertainty and unrest in Burundi and had been living in refugee camps in Rwanda. They'd recently returned and, and the church there is able to help provide them with, with counseling uh, if they need that. It's able to help provide them with skills needed to, to start their own businesses, to, to be able to provide an income for themselves. And in the community have, have banded together and they've actually raised over 30,000 pounds themselves as a community to build a health center uh, in the community. So people are no longer having to travel hundreds of miles in order to receive any health care, but they have it right there. And what's happening as a result, the church is growing. The church is having to plant new churches throughout the community of this mountainside area of Burundi down in the southern part of that country. We're seeing God do some incredible things around that church, around that country, and it's all through the local church. Last year, I was uh, able to visit uh, Ethiopia and spend uh, 10 days uh, traveling around that country. I wasn't very popular at home when I mentioned to my wife that I'd be leaving her for 10 days to look after three young kids, but uh, I had a, a great time traveling that country and got to see about 15 or 16 projects that Tear Fund support. Uh, and we started off, we went to the northern part of Ethiopia, which is known as the Afar region. And it's the Afari tribe that live there. They're a very nomadic tribe. They, they move from, from place to place with their herds of, of camels and, and of goats. And it's a predominantly Muslim part of the country. They're very closed off to Christians. They're, uh, they're, they're very uh, against uh, uh, Christians in, in some of the communities. But we partner with a local Christian organization that was set up by a man by the name of Goret, uh, who was part of the Afari tribe, was grew, grew up uh, in the Islam faith, uh, but had an incredible encounter with God. And for the last 16 years, he's devoted his life to helping his people, to sharing the gospel uh, through, uh, through practical ways, but also through, through sharing uh, of, of, of the life of Jesus. And that's come at a great cost. He's literally had his brothers and sisters try to kill him on a number of occasions. When we visited, the tensions had somewhat died down, but we were still 
uh, uh, quite aware of, of, the, of the, uh, what was going on. But, but, but Gourette there has been able to build uh, schools. He's been able to uh, build water wells in communities where prior to that, uh, people had to sit on, by the side of the road for hours, sometimes days, waiting for a water truck to come from the capital to, to fill up their canteens. And sometimes that truck wouldn't come, and so they would return back to their village without water. It's also a very dangerous road, a lot of trucks going up and down there, um, and so people would often get, get uh, in road uh, accidents because of that. Uh, and also human trafficking is a huge, huge issue in that part of the country. So this water well was set up, was able to provide the people of the village with, with clean water, able to feed the livestock for, for the livestock. They then pumped the water up to the local school so the school children were able to learn about hand sanitation and how to keep themselves clean. The water was then used to irrigate the field behind the school to grow crops, to feed the children with healthy, nutritious uh, vegetables. The surplus uh, uh, vegetables that was grown were then sold off at the marketplace so they were able to generate an income for the school to pay for school resources. The water was then pumped down uh, to the health clinic in the community to provide uh, sanitation there as well. It was incredible to see a complete transformation within this community. And another community that Tear Fund had been working in in that, in that part of Ethiopia, uh, we, we found out uh, just last summer that in this area, although it's, although it's uh, Islamic and Muslim community, there's actually 17 women coming together and praying to Jesus because they're seeing the impact that the church is having on their community. I thought that was amazing. The 17 people now praying to Jesus because they're saying, we know that there must be something more to these Christians than that meets the eye. And so they're actually, there's beginning to be a shift of, of people's uh, perception towards the Christian faith. And so that's why we do what we do and partner with local churches and Christian organizations um, so that there is an ongoing lifelong impact. We then left the Afar region. We went to the, uh, to the western part of Ethiopia, which is known as the Highlands, uh, very mountainous, um, and is where they grow a lot of crops. And on our last day there, I was told that we just had one more project that we were going to get taken to, and then we could stay, uh, can go and rest in the hotel. And, and I was so excited to sit and rest in the hotel. It had been quite a tiring week of bumpy roads and, and Land Rovers, and I was just, it was music to my ears to get to spend the rest of the day uh, resting in the hotel. But what they failed to mention was that last project involved an eight-hour round trip uh, along one of the bumpiest, most scariest roads I think I've ever been on in my life. If you've ever seen Indiana Jones, it was kind of similar to that, with sheer cliff faces on one side, rickety bridges um, to cross. And I don't think I've ever prayed so fervently uh, as I did in that eight-hour trek uh, up in the mountains. And actually, at one point, we had our Ethiopian colleague sitting uh, in between us in the back seat, and she grabbed my leg so hard that I thought the circulation was going to stop as we crossed that second rickety bridge. But we finally found our way to uh, a mountain community and, and hiked up into the mountains, which 27 degrees hiking and for a Scot is quite treacherous. Uh, but we made it up to a community, and we were welcomed into a man's house, and this man was part of uh, what's, what we call a self-help group, which was set up by our church partner in the area. And self-help groups are groups of 15 to 20 people that uh, they come together, they study the word uh, together each week, they learn a bit about, uh, what, about what, it's, what it means to start up your own business, they can take a loan to set, to set up their business, they can be empowered and trained and equipped to, to do that. And so we were welcomed into this man's house and he uh, was part of a group that was set up for people with disabilities in that part of, of Ethiopia and he had no use of his legs from the waist down and so he was pulling himself along the floor. Now if you're somebody uh, with disabilities in a country like Ethiopia you are seen as bringing a curse upon your family and so many families will hide you away or they'll throw you out of the house they'll say that you've got no use that you're that you're worthless that you have nothing to give. And so this man for his entire life had been told that he was worthless. But this, through this self-help group, he was able to learn skills about how to cultivate his wee field behind his house. And he was able to grow food there to feed his kids and to feed his, his livestock. He was then able to sell off the, the surplus food that was 
uh, able to generate an income for his, himself and his family. And as a result, people were beginning to come to him and ask him for help and advice on how to do the same in their own lives. And as he was telling us this story, he leaned forward and he said something to me that stuck with me ever since. He said, my whole life I have learned how to take from people, but this program has enabled me to give back. And I thought that is a true life transformation. That is somebody stepping into their true identity in Christ uh, through this program and through the work of the local church. And so that's why we do what we do. That is why we work only with churches and, and church organizations in all the countries that we're a part of. Because we want to see God's name glorified. We want to see people step into their true identity in Christ. I could stay up here all morning and share countless other stories, but I will pass back now uh, over, uh, pass on to the next part of the service. But thank you so much for, for listening to me. If you want to be a part of that, you can join us in prayer. We value prayer so much in Tear Fund that it's actually written into my contract that from 9 to 10 every Wednesday morning, I'm not allowed to work. I, instead, I join online prayers that's led by our global Tear Fund staff. So some, some weeks it's in Swahili, other weeks it's in Spanish or Arabic, or depending on which part of the world it's led of. So you can join us by praying for the work that we're doing. We have prayer diaries on that table at the back that you can that kind of help highlight some of the work that we're doing. Or if you felt led to, to give financially, just six pounds a month over the course of a year can help train and equip a local church to become a center for transformation within their communities. So if you'd like to talk to me, I'm, I'm here after the service. I'd love to get to meet you and, and chat to you. Uh, so thank you for your time. I'll pass back over. Thank you so much, Robbie. And it's just such a privilege for us to hear about that work. Uh, it's just so exciting to hear of God doing such amazing things all over the world. So thank you very, very much. And as Robbie said, please do take the chance to speak to him afterwards. There's literature on the table at the back as well. So uh, we'd love to love for you to take the opportunity just to find out more about the, the wonderful work of Tearfund. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to let the boys and girls head out to Sunday School and Creche. And we are going to sing together in Gaelic uh, from Psalm 25. Uh, these are the verses that we had as our call to worship, and uh, we're going to um, uh, sing them now together in Gaelic. So, if you have never sung a Gaelic psalm before, don't panic. Um, it's actually nice and straightforward, not too difficult, but it is a little bit different to singing in English. So, um, we will sing the first two lines all together. So, Murdo will be leading us, and he'll sing the first two lines, but it says, to li ho a ye, thy ways, Lord, show, teach me thy path. Then the second line, ad chemen chekish me. Uh, so, we'll sing all those lines together. And then from the third line onwards, where it says, this Murder will sing that on his own. And then we will sing that line back to him. So, you've got no excuse for not knowing what to sing, because Murder will sing it. And then we just sing it back. Um, and so, we then follow that pattern through the rest of this verse and on into the next verse. And as we sing these words, even if you don't have Gaelic, you've got the English there, so you know what's been said. We're praying to the Lord to show us his ways, to teach us his paths, to lead us, uh, to, uh, to recognize the fact that he is our Lord. Uh, he is the one who gives us salvation and we are waiting on him every day. So we stay seated to sing in Gaelic. Murder will lead us and we can sing out uh, together to God's praise. Bye.
going to read together uh, now from John's Gospel. We're continuing our study uh, in John this morning and we are picking up at John chapter 18 and our readings from verse 28 to 40. Uh, I'm delighted to ask Neil, one of our elders, to come forward uh, to read this morning's passage. Good morning. Reading from verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early it was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own laws. Then Jesus said to him, It is not lawful uh, for us, sorry, the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation, said the chief, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from those, from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone, who is of the truth, listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is the truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Amen. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, let's pray together again. Father, we thank you so much that we can come before you today, and we thank you that as we come to you, we can just pour our hearts out to you in prayer. And we're so encouraged to hear from Robbie about the work of Tear Fund, and it just reminds us um, that, that you are working all across the globe, and we thank you so much for the way in which the work of Tear Fund brings um, relief to those who are suffering, those who are facing disasters, but, but most importantly that it brings, helps bring the good news of Jesus, helps churches to share the gospel. And, um, and it's so amazing to hear of lives being transformed in, in places that, that we've never been um, and, and in many ways that we, uh, that we can almost not imagine because they're so different to how... Uh, how our lives are here and yet we thank you so so much for the way in which the gospel is advancing in uh, in Ethiopia and 
in so many other parts of the world. And so we pray for Robbie and for all his colleagues uh, with Tear Fund all across the world. We pray that their work would thrive, that you'd continue to bless them, guide them and help them, uh, and may, may uh, they continue to be able to equip churches uh, all across the globe. And we pray for that target of 250,000, that it will be reached, um, uh, in fact, that it will be smashed, that they will get way past it, and that you would bless them as they, they, they seek to serve you. And we pray, Father, uh, that you'd help us uh, ourselves as well as we seek to follow you. And as we turn to your word shortly, we pray that we would uh, hear your voice speaking to us. And we pray again that our hearts would be receptive, that you would lead us in your ways and teach us your path. And for all of us, we pray that you would help us all to take the next step in our journey um, of faith in Jesus. For some of us, that's the first step. And we pray that we would see people come to trust in Jesus and that even here today, um, um, that, there will be, that people would just hear your voice calling them. And whatever our next step is, whether it's to trust in you or to, uh, or to, to, to tell others that we do trust in you or to, uh, to renew our commitment in you or to turn away from sin or to, to get involved in something that, that might serve you or even to, to share our testimony for the book, that whatever the next step is, help us to take it and please guide us and be with us as we, we turn to your word together just now. We ask it all in the name of your Son, our Saviour Jesus. Amen. Well, before we come back to John's Gospel, we're going to sing again together. This time we're singing the hymn, There is a Redeemer. Um, this is an older hymn, a well-known one, but it's beautiful, and it just reminds us of God's amazing purposes in sending his Son, in, his, in leaving his Spirit with us, uh, and in completing the great work of salvation that uh, he purposed to do. So the musicians will lead us, and we'll stand and sing together. As I said, today we are continuing our study uh, in John's Gospel. We've come to the second half of chapter 18, and I want to read again verses 37 to 38. Then Pilate said to him, So you're a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, 
For this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. So we're moving towards the climax of John's gospel. All the way through uh, his book so far, he's pointing us forward to the cross. And now for Jesus, the hour has come. The cross is looming. Everything is reaching a climax. Um, And as Phil said last week, at the heart of Christianity stands Jesus' death on the cross. That's what everything, everything that John's gospel, everything that the whole uh, of uh, the Bible is pointing towards. And, And John gives us loads of detail about these days leading up to the cross. And one detail that he gives us is this fascinating interaction that we have between Jesus and the Roman governor, Pilate. And that's what I want to spend a wee wee bit of time looking at today because Pilate is a very, very intriguing person. Because at one level, the cross has got nothing to do with him. He's not been involved with Jesus up until now. He's been neither a follower nor an opponent. And here, he only gets dragged into the whole affair Because as verse 31 tells us, the Jews aren't allowed uh, to put someone to death without his permission. So there's a sense in which the cross has got nothing to do with Pilate. Yet at the same time, the cross has got everything to do with Pilate. Because he's the one who actually hands over Jesus. And in doing so, he condemns him to death. And because of that, The name Pilate is known all over the world because of the role he had in Jesus being sent to the cross. And as you read the second half of John 18, and as you read on into chapter 19, there's this fascinating tension between, in Pilate, between the impressions he has of Jesus and the pressure that the crowd are putting upon him. I want to suggest today that Pilate is also fascinating because he is maybe the person in John's gospel who is most relevant for us to think about today. The reason he's relevant is because he's doing something that thousands of people in Scotland want to do today. He's doing something that so many of us want to do as well. What is he doing? Well, when it comes to Jesus, He wants to stay neutral. I've said this many times before, but I have very rarely met people who are vigorously opposed to Christianity. Um, And even the people who I have met in my life who have been quite opposed to the gospel, it doesn't tend to be because they're opposed to the idea of God or to the claims of the gospel. Usually their hostility is because they've been hurt by somebody who goes to church. I don't tend to meet people who are, who are just viciously opposed to the gospel. But what I do meet is a lot of people who just want to be neutral. And that, of course, is a reflection of where we are in terms of intellectual history in the Western world. We live in a society that's heavily influenced um, by what we call postmodernism. And that's the, uh, that's the philosophy that's characterized by the idea that you can't make exclusive truth claims. So you can't say that there's one absolute truth. And there's no overarching reality that explains life. And instead, truth is seen as something very individualized, something very subjective. And that's why today you'll see that the most important truth principle for many people is that you just need to be true to yourself. And that's a very, very postmodern way of thinking. And the consequence of that in terms of the gospel is that many, many people are respectful, but they just want to remain more or less neutral. And people will say, well, it's great that you've got that in your life, but I just just want to stay neutral. Loads of people want to stay neutral. Some of them are sitting in here. Some of them are watching online. And so it's such an important thing for us to think about. And uh, as we look at Pilate, our title comes from his question um, in verse 38, what is truth? And we're going to look at two main headings, building neutrality, dismantling neutrality. 
So starting here uh, with building neutrality. When we look at Pilate, you can see various ways in which he wants to try and build a neutral position for himself. First of all, he starts by basically saying, I don't want to get involved in this. So when they come uh, to Jesus, uh, when they come with Jesus to Pilate, um, they said, he comes out to meet them. He says, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they say, well, if he wasn't doing evil, we wouldn't have taken him. And he says, take him yourselves. Judge him by your own law. So while they're standing there at the entrance to his headquarters, his instinct is just to send the crowd away. But of course, as we said, imperial law, which Pilate himself represents, forces him to be involved. So then we see the second thing. He doesn't really want to have an opinion. So as he interacts with Jesus, he asks him if he's the king of the Jews. Jesus says, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you? And Pilate says, am I a Jew? It's your own nation that's delivered them over to me. What have you done? And so Jesus, as he often does in these verses, answers a question with another question and forces Pilate to think about what he's saying. But Pilate's response is just to say, am I a Jew? What's this got to do with me? And look, he's, he's saying, it's as though he's saying, look, this doesn't involve me. I'm not here to have an opinion on some Jewish religious controversy. All he wants is bare facts. He's like, what have you done? What's, what's all this about? He doesn't want to be forced into having his own opinion. So he doesn't want to get involved, doesn't want to have his own opinion. Thirdly, he doesn't really want to make a decision. And this is the fascinating thing we see in verses 36 uh, to 40. Um, if you look at what happens, you can see that in verse 39, there's a telling statement where he basically goes to them and he says to the Jews, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to release your king? And then it's like, you know, you've got this habit, that you've got this custom that I should release someone for you. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? Um, you can see that he's just trying to really put the decision onto them rather than take it himself. And in all these ways, Pilate just wants to stay neutral, doesn't want to get involved doesn't want to have to have an opinion, doesn't want to make a decision. And so many people are just like him. And this issue of neutrality affects all of us, every single one of us. It's important for anybody here who's maybe not yet a believer or who's maybe not sure where they stand or who's maybe a not yeter in the sense of, yes, one day I want to become a Christian. As I said, I don't often meet people who are hostile to the gospel. I don't think anybody here is hostile to the gospel. I don't think anybody's skeptical about the claims of Christianity. I don't think anyone here is cynical about what the Bible says. These people do exist, but I don't think any of them are here. I don't think any are watching at home. But so many of us are tempted to follow the same line of thinking as Pilate. I just gravitate towards a more neutral position. So when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to faith in Jesus, when it comes to thinking about the next step, when it comes to committing to a life of discipleship, when it comes to participating in the life of the church, it's easy to think, I don't really want to get too involved. So maybe you, you don't doubt the importance of what the Bible is saying, but you tend to think, well, Everything that's been said here it applies more to other people than to me. Thomas isn't really talking to me. It's, it's others that need to hear this more than I do. And as the gospel presses us with the big questions of life and death, of time and eternity, of truth and reality, I just think, I just don't want to get involved. It's also easy to think, I don't want to have to have an opinion and so, so many people can be sucked in by the temptation to just kind of shrug our shoulders, to think, well, I, I don't really know. I'm not sure. And as the gospel forces us to think about what we really think, it's so easy to retreat to the idea, I just don't really want to have to have an opinion on this. And like Pilate, it's easy to think, I don't really want to make a decision. 
And this is definitely something that leaves lots of people as what we could call gospel not yetters. Now, I think everybody knows what I mean by that. People who know that they need Jesus, who know that ultimately this is more important than anything else, and who know that on the day you die, you, you need to have your relationship with God right. And so you think, yes, I will, but not yet. I don't want to make a decision. I want to defer a decision. It's so easy to think like that. Sometimes it can be because of our own uncertainties or difficulties. Other times it's because maybe we feel that somebody else has made a decision that's put a hurdle in, uh, in our way. So sometimes maybe, maybe we feel somebody said something to us once uh, or maybe we've seen other people. Maybe, maybe I saw my parents. They didn't commit to following Jesus, so I'm not going to. Or maybe we've seen a Christian who's actually a hypocrite and we think, well, I don't want to be like that. And so all of these reasons are used to kind of build, um, uh, build a position where we just want to stay neutral we don't want to make a decision. It's so easy to gravitate towards neutrality. But it doesn't just affect those of, those of us who are maybe not sure or who haven't yet put our faith in Jesus. It also affects every one of us in our life as disciples, as followers of Jesus. As Christians, we can struggle with exactly the same temptations. So we can see um, the ongoing life and work of the church. We can see opportunities to serve. We can see needs that have to be met. We can see things that are going to cost us, maybe in terms of time and energy, but, but are needed. And yet we think, oh, I just don't want to get involved. Now, obviously, everybody has a limited amount of time and energy. And I have to say that in this church here, you are so amazing at what you do and so generous with your time and energy and resources. But it's always a temptation for us to just back off from involvement in the church uh, family. It's, it's easy to find ourselves in the position, and I was in this position, I think, um, in my early adult years, where I was like, yes, I absolutely have faith in Jesus, but I don't really want it to interfere with my day-to-day -day life too much. It's so easy, in practical terms, to, to want to stay a wee bit more neutral. We can also struggle with the, the temptation to not really want to have an opinion. Or perhaps more accurately, we don't want to reveal our opinion. Um, and that can, the, the consequence of that can often be that we can shy away from making decisions. And often that's because we don't want to have to carry responsibility. And often churches are paralyzed because there's a decision to be made. There's an opportunity to be taken. But people shy away from doing it. Not because they disagree with it, but because they don't want to be blamed or criticized by others. They don't want to be the ones who have to show their opinion. Um, and that can, that can hold us back so easily. We're all prone to this. We're all drawn to neutrality. I can say all this because I've struggled with that temptation myself. I think there's two reasons why uh, this can happen, two main reasons anyway why this can happen. One, neutrality looks comfortable. And often in the short term, it is more comfortable because big questions, big issues, big decisions are not comfortable and they're not easy things to think about. I'm a hopeless decision maker. I, I can't choose what to have for dinner on the ferry because there's too many good options. Um, and so you, you think of the bigger questions of life. When do I change the car? What one should I go for? Should I buy a house? Do I have plans for my pension? None of these are comfortable things to think about. They're hard, stressful, painful questions. And if they are uncomfortable, how much more the question, where do I stand with Jesus? Where am I going to spend eternity? A hard question makes neutrality look comfortable. But the key point is that neutrality never makes the question go away. It never makes the question go away. It just makes the question bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I hate changing my car. Just hate it. Don't like buying cars. Don't like selling cars. Hate haggling with a passion. I have an allergy to it. So I just hate, hate all of that. I feel like I'm getting ripped off. I just hate it. And so I never want to change my car. And so I've kept my car for years. And it's falling apart. And 
it's just falling apart more rapidly all the time. And I think I just want to stay neutral. I don't want to have to think about changing the car. And do you know what I'm doing? I'm making the problem bigger and bigger and bigger. And every year I leave it, the more it's going to cost me to change the car. I need to just do it. But I'm not going to do it <laughs> because I don't want to do it. And now I'm a hypocrite because I'm telling you to do exactly the thing that I struggle to do. And I'm just saying I understand what it's like. But I'm trying to highlight the point that if you leave something, you just make it bigger. Neutrality doesn't make these questions go away. And neutrality about Jesus is not going to make this question go away. It just presses me more and more urgently. So neutrality can look comfortable. It's not. But the second reason why we're drawn towards neutrality is this, and this is even more important, we stay neutral about the gospel because there's something else that we cannot be neutral about. In other words, we stay neutral about the gospel because there's something else that we care about more. So for example, I, I have come across many people who are anxious about what people might say about them. And that's a particularly acute problem in a rural community where people know what time you put your washing out, let alone um, you know, whether you profess faith in Jesus. Everybody knows everything in a rural community. And people can easily come to the conclusion where they think, well, I'm not going to commit to Jesus. Certainly, I'm not going to do anything public because people will talk about me and I don't want that. But do you see what that means? It means that you are being neutral about Jesus because you cannot be neutral about other people's opinions. And are you sure you want it to be that way around? It's the same with, you know, with maybe lifestyle habits that, that Jesus might get in the way of or a sin that we know we will have to, to strive to repent of and to leave behind as we follow him or or a fear that following Jesus is going to disrupt our plans or dreams for life. If any of these issues are leaving you neutral about the gospel, it's because you're not neutral about that issue. And I just want you to think about whether that's a wise decision. Pilate wanted neutrality. Did he make a wise decision? So often we're drawn to it. It's not a good idea. So Pilate is building neutrality and in many ways we don't want to follow him. The gospel, however, dismantles neutrality. And we see that in the question that Pilate asks in verse 38, that question, what is truth? And I think it's a fascinating question to think about because um, you know, Pilate responds to Jesus by saying, well, how is anyone supposed to know what's true? How is anyone supposed to know for sure anyway? And I think his question here is, is kind of an attempt at a bit of a shrug of the shoulders. It's like, well, can't be sure of anything. And he doesn't want to be pressed into a verdict. But the question's fascinating because in terms of what Pilate is trying to do, it's actually self-defeating. Because I think he means it in a kind of vague, general, neutral sense, you know, What's truth? As if the only answer could be, who knows? And yet the question demands an answer. What is truth? What is reliable, accurate, ultimate truth? And standing in front of him, Jesus is saying, it's me. I am the truth. And the minute Jesus does that, Pilate is forced into a verdict because neutrality has evaporated. Jesus is saying, I have come to bear witness to the truth. Pilate cannot respond to that with a neutral, hmm, well, maybe. When Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, a maybe is not a neutral deferral of a decision. A maybe is no. I don't agree with you. And that's the key point. Neutrality is not compatible with the claims of the gospel. And we see that when we think about some of the things that Jesus has said earlier in John's gospel. He told Nicodemus, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And he said to his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These are key claims that Jesus makes, and they are exclusive claims. And this is where it's so important to remember that the gospel is totally exclusive and wholly inclusive. And we have to make sure we know what these are meaning. It's totally exclusive in that Jesus, that that only Jesus can save sinners. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's totally exclusive. But the gospel is also wholly inclusive because every single sinner, no matter who they are, is called to come to him. Everyone, everyone is offered the salvation that Jesus and only Jesus can provide. Now you might fully agree with what Jesus is saying or you might recoil from these kind of truth claims. But the one thing we cannot do, one thing that even a small amount of intellectual reasoning tells us is that these kind of claims make neutrality impossible. And you see that in Pilate. For Pilate, neutrality was impossible. Because even though he tried to turn the questions away from himself, even though he goes on to declare that he finds no guilt in Jesus, and even though that we know from Matthew's gospel, he actually literally tried, he washed his hands to try and sort of absolve himself of any involvement, yet still he cannot claim neutrality. He wants to just let go of responsibility, but by letting go, he is actually throwing Jesus to a br- into a brutal execution. The claims of the gospel and neutrality are incompatible. Incompatible for Pilate, incompatible for us. As we close, I want to ask the question, why does the gospel do this? Why does the gospel dismantle neutrality? I want to suggest three reasons as we finish. One is because when it comes to the most important things in life, neutrality is deadly. So, uh, Kate has been diagnosed with cancer. She cannot be neutral about it, or she will die. She has to respond to that diagnosis, and so does everybody else who's in the same situation as her. If your house is on fire, you cannot be neutral. If you see somebody who's had too much to drink walking on the pier in Stornoway, staggering towards the edge, you just stand neutrally watching them. They're going to die if they fall in. And the deadliness of neutrality is absolutely real, more real than anywhere else than when it comes to the gospel. Jesus is calling us to trust in him, and by doing so we can have eternal life. Neutrality is not safe. Neutrality is deadly. Second reason why the gospel dismantles our neutrality is because being neutral about Jesus is rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. Being neutral about Jesus is rubbish in comparison to knowing him. In a sermon like this, it's so easy to focus on the seriousness and urgency of the gospel, and it's right to do that because nothing is more serious, nothing is more urgent. But that is only half the story. It's only half the story because alongside the seriousness of the gospel is the fact that knowing Jesus is just brilliant. And neutrality doesn't just expose you to something dangerous, it also leaves you missing out something so amazing. Missing out the joy and the peace and the security and the purpose and the meaning and the identity that you can only find through knowing Jesus as your Savior. And then number three, last of all, the biggest reason why the gospel dismantles your neutrality is because Jesus is not neutral about you. 
Jesus is not neutral about you. Everything that we're reading about in this chapter is moving us towards the cross. And the whole reason the cross happened is because Jesus is not neutral about you. When it comes to saving you, Jesus doesn't say, don't involve me. He doesn't say, I don't really have an opinion. He doesn't say, I don't want to make a decision. When Jesus looks at you and at me and sees our sin, our lostness, our desperate need, he doesn't respond with neutrality. He responds by saying, I'm going. I'm going to the cross so that I can save you. He does it because he's never neutral about you. Please don't stay neutral about him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so, so much for everything that you have said and everything that you have done for us. And we recognize today that this presses into our hearts the biggest and most important questions of life and death. And we thank you so much that in the midst of that, we have your arms open before us, calling, calling us to come to you. And we pray that you'd help each of us to take that next step. Help us to see neutrality for what it really is, not for what it kind of pretends to be. And help us also to see the beauty and security and peace that the gospel can bring. Be with us all, lead us on, guide us and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude uh, singing together from Psalm 31, uh, verses 1 to 6. Uh, These are beautiful words, um, speaking of taking refuge in God, that he's our shelter, he's the one who hears us, he's our rock, he's our defense. Um, and uh, it closes with a great, great, great statement that we, we are turning away from anything false and we are trusting the Lord because he is true. So these, can be, these words can both be our prayer and our words of praise as we close together. Murder will lead us and we'll stand to sing. And here I've taken refuge, Lord. Here are my shelter in distress. Oh, let me never be ashamed, but save me. As you go into a new week, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all God's people say, Amen.
Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, there's tea and coffee, and we have some wonderful baking left over from last night. So uh, it's like we're up a level from the normal biscuits this week. So well worth staying behind for that. A reminder that you can get the chance to catch Robbie uh, after the service. Um, and we'd love to just enjoy a bit of time together and then service 